Rockefeller made sure to get the better end of the bargain. He would donate his great wealth to the creation of public institutions, but those institutions would be used to bend society to his will. As every would-be ruler throughout history has realized, society has to be transformed from the ground up. Americans in the 19th century still prized education and intellectual pursuits, with the 1840 census finding unsurprisingly that the United States, a nation that had been mobilized by tracts like Thomas Paine's remarkably popular Common Sense, was a nation of readers, with a remarkable 93% to 100% literacy rate. Before the first compulsory schooling laws in Massachusetts in 1852, education was private and decentralized, and as a result classical education, including study of Greek and Latin and a solid grounding in history and science, was widespread. But a nation of individuals who could think for themselves was anathema to the monopolists. The oligarchs needed a mass of obedient workers, an entire class of people whose intellect was developed just enough to prepare them for lives of drudgery in a factory. Into the midst stepped John D. Rockefeller with his first great act of public charity, the establishment of the University of Chicago. He was aided in this task by Frederick Taylor Gates, a Baptist minister that Rockefeller befriended in 1889 and who would go on to be John D.'s most trusted philanthropic advisor. Gates would go on to write a short tract, The Country School of Tomorrow, that laid out the Rockefeller plan for education. In our dream, we have limitless resources, and the people yield themselves with perfect docility to our molding hand. The present educational conventions fade from our minds, and, unhampered by tradition, we work our own goodwill upon a grateful and responsive folk. We shall not try to make these people or any of their children into philosophers, or men of learning or science. We are not to raise up from among them authors, orators, poets, or men of letters. We shall not search for embryo great artists, painters, musicians. Nor will we cherish even the humbler ambition to raise up from among them lawyers, doctors, preachers, politicians, statesmen, of whom we now have ample supply. Although Rockefeller's resources weren't exactly limitless, they might as well have been. In 1902, he established the General Education Board to help implement Gates' vision for the country school of tomorrow with a staggering $180 million endowment. The Rockefeller influence on education was felt almost immediately, and it was amplified by help from fellow monopolists of the era who were approaching the topic of philanthropy from the same angle. Although best known as a steel magnate, Andrew Carnegie's fortune started on the railroads transporting Rockefeller's standard oil around the country, and was greatly magnified by a lucrative investment in property near Oil Creek that provided steady, profitable oil sales. In 1905, he established the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, a tax-free foundation through which Carnegie and his appointees could direct the development of the education system in the United States, and, eventually, worldwide. In 1910, Rockefeller followed suit by establishing the Rockefeller Foundation, which became the tax-free umbrella organization for his philanthropic ambitions. As the Reese Committee, a congressional investigation into the activities of these tax-free foundations in the 1950s discovered, it wasn't long before Carnegie's endowment approached Rockefeller's foundation with a proposal to cooperate on their shared desire to transform the American education system in their own image. Norman Dodd, the director of research for the congressional committee who was granted access to the Carnegie Endowment's board minutes, explains. So they approach the Rockefeller Foundation with the suggestion that that portion of education which is, could be considered domestic be handled by the Rockefeller Foundation and that portion which is international should be handled by the endowment. And they then decide that the key to the success of these two operations lay in the, an alteration of the teaching of American history. So they approach four of the then most prominent teachers of American history in the country, people like Charles and Mary Byrd, and their suggestion to them is will they alter the manner in which they present this subject and they get turned down flat. So they then decide that it is necessary for them to do, as they say, build our own stable of historians. 
And, if, and then they approach the Guggenheim Foundation, which specializes in fellowships, and say, when we find young men in the process of studying for doctorates in the field of American history, and we feel that they are uh, the right caliber, will you grant them fellowships on our say-so? And the answer is yes. So under that condition, eventually they assemble 20. And they take this 20 potential teachers of American history to London, and there they're briefed into what is expected of them when, as, and if they secure appointments in keeping with the doctorates they will have earned. And um, that, new, that group of 20 historians ultimately becomes the nucleus of the American Historical Association. And then toward the end of the 1920s, the endowment grants to the American Historical Association $400,000 for a study of our history in a manner which points to what can this country be, can it look forward to in the future. And uh, that culminates in a seven volume study book study, the last volume of which is, of course, in essence, a summary of the contents of the other six. And the essence of the last volume is the future of this country belongs to collectivism administered with characteristic American efficiency. <laughs>